Thank you very much, Professor Mirsheim. Thank you for uh, letting us do, do the interview at your home in Chicago. My pleasure. And we know DNC was just held in uh, Chicago. And we know you are the top of the top expert in international relations. But the first question I'll ask you is about domestic issue and about the U.S. election. Just one month ago, we know that it was Joe Biden who supposedly should give the acceptance speech. But last night, it was Kamala Harris. And Donald Trump is running again for the U.S. president. So we used to have two of the most senior uh, presidential candidates in the U.S. history. And now, uh, four years ago, Donald Trump was, according to a poll, the least popular president in the U.S. history. And one year ago, Kamala Harris was, the, uh, according to Paul, the least popular vice president in the U.S. history. So now we have the two least popular presidential candidates in the U.S. history, in a sense. So what does this say about the U.S. politics nowadays? I think it's quite clear that with regard to both Biden and Trump, the American public did not want either one of them to be running for president. And with regard to Kamala Harris, not only was she a wildly unpopular vice president, but most people, when you ask them, will tell you that she's not terribly well qualified to be president. Uh, when she ran for president, she did not get a single uh, delegate. Uh, and uh, nobody thought it was possible that she would ever become president of the United States, except if Joe Di Biden had died in office. So basically what we have here are three candidates uh, who are highly unattractive to the public. Uh, they're not seen as the kind of heavyweights that you would expect to lead the United States, especially in these complicated times. I think all of this tells you that the American political system is broken, that there's a fundamental problem here, that any system that produces candidates like Joe Biden, uh, Donald Trump, and Kamala Harris uh, is in serious trouble. Why is this happening? It's very hard to say. Uh, the fact is that uh, there's a great deal of dissatisfaction in this country. Uh, and that dissatisfaction has manifested itself in the rise of Donald Trump and also the rise of Bernie Sanders. You want to remember that in 2016, Bernie Sanders would have defeated Hillary Clinton uh, in the Democratic primaries if the Re Democratic Party had allowed the process to play itself out. Uh, the senior Democratic leaders intervened and made sure that Hillary beat Bernie Sanders. And basically the same thing happened again in 2020. Sanders was on his way to defeating Biden and the elders in the Democratic Party intervened uh, to make sure that Sanders didn't win. So what I'm saying here is the fact that Trump uh, was the presidential candidate for the Republicans in 2016, 2020, and 2024 uh, despite the fact that there was a huge amount of opposition to him inside the Republican Party, uh, tells you that there is great dissatisfaction in the land. And there's also uh, lots of reason to think that Bernie Sanders' uh, excellent showing in both 2016 and 2020 tells you that there's deep-seated dissatisfaction in the land. So what's happened here is that the American political system is not working well for lots of people uh, in the body politic. And therefore, people like Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump are doing very well. Uh, but nevertheless, the system is kind of rigged. So instead of Sanders winning in 2016 or 2020, you got Joe Biden. Uh, and Biden is uh, uh, sort of a stop, was seen as a stopgap measure, but he decided instead of just being president for four years, he wanted to be president for eight years. And uh, that was not possible because it's quite clear that his mental faculties have deteriorated to the point where he's not capable of being president for another four years. It's not clear he's going to be able to make it all the way to the end of his 
first term in January 2025. But nevertheless, he was protected uh, by his inner circle. And if it hadn't been for that catastrophic debate, he may be running for president uh, right now. And he might have even been elected uh, in November. Uh, and again, this tells you that there's something wrong. But the, the, the issue is that we know there are apparently a better candidates among this 300 million population than the three. So can the, the, this system produce better or best candidates in the future? Who knows? Uh, for it to produce better candidates, the system has to be fixed. And the people who are getting uh, elected, the people who come into power, have no incentive to fix the system because the system has put them in power. Mm. So it's not clear uh, whether the American political system, which many people believe, me included, is broken, uh, can be fixed uh, in the foreseeable future. Most people argue that if you have a broken system, the only thing that leads to it being fixed is a major crisis, a depression, a war, or what have you. But uh, hopefully we won't have a depression or a war. Uh, but if we don't have one of those things, then the system is not likely to be fixed. Okay, now to talk about the election, and we heard uh, Kamala Harris gave her policy on Ukraine. And also, we, we know the attitude of Donald Trump towards Ukraine. So how will this election change the fate of Ukraine? Well, I think if you listen to Kamala Harris's speech at the Democratic National Convention, it's clear that from her perspective, nothing is going to change on Ukraine, that she is going to maintain the status quo. She's going to do towards Ukraine what Joe Biden has done in his four years in the White House. Trump is a different matter. Trump has said that he wants to fundamentally alter U.S. policy toward Ukraine. It's very important to understand that Trump is not talking about changing U.S. policy toward China. And he's not talking about changing U.S. policy toward the Middle East. And here we're talking about with regard to Israel. The one place where Trump is talking about changing American policy in a fundamental way is Ukraine. And in that regard, he differs substantially from Kamala Harris. The question you have to ask yourself is, do you think that Trump can deliver on his promise? Mm. Do you think that Trump can come into the White House uh, and, in effect, settle the Ukrainian war and improve relations with the Russians and, in particular, improve relations with Putin? Trump believes he can do that. In fact, Trump has said that he will solve the Ukraine problem if he's elected in November before he moves into the White House. I actually do not believe that Trump will be able to shut down the Ukraine war. Uh, I think that Trump will end up uh, maintaining the status quo in Ukraine. I think the only thing that will change the course of the war in Ukraine and the course of America's relationship with Ukraine is if Ukraine loses on the battlefield. I think what happens in the in the fight itself is what really matters here. But I think the idea that Trump can come in and work out a deal uh, with uh, Putin is not likely. And the principal reason for that is that Putin's demands are not ones that Trump could easily accept. You want to remember that Putin has made it clear in a speech on June 14th of this year that two conditions have to be met before he will even agree to call a ceasefire and start negotiations with Ukraine and with the West. These are two preconditions. One precondition is that Ukraine and the West have to formally agree that the four oblasts that Russia has now annexed are now and forever Russian territory. And, of course, the same applies to Crimea. Furthermore, the Ukrainians and the Americans, here we're talking about the West, have to accept the fact that Ukraine cannot be in NATO. They have to declare that Ukraine will be a neutral state. 
These are the two preconditions that Trump has to agree to before Putin even agrees to negotiate. In his debate, in Trump's debate with Joe Biden, Trump was explicitly asked whether he would agree to those two preconditions, and he said no. Well, if he will not agree to those two preconditions, then there are going to be no negotiations and there's going to be no settlement. So what Trump has to do is he has to be willing to accept the fact that Ukraine cannot be in NATO. He has to accept the fact that those four oblasts that the Russians have annexed belong to Russia forever and that the Crimea belongs to Russia forever. Mm -hmm. And that's just the starting point for negotiations. I find it hard to imagine, given how much Russophobia there is in the United States, uh, that he would be able to get away with doing that. But now let's talk about Kamala Harris' policy. He, she wants to continue uh, Joe Biden's policy, but at the same time we see multiple Republican congressmen. Uh, they don't want to uh, support or put more money into Ukraine. So if Kamala Harris is elected, can she sustain this policy to like give the blank check kind of to Ukraine? Well, that remains to be seen. I mean, the key point that we can take away from her speech at the Democratic National Convention, Convention is that she will go to great lengths to continue to support Ukraine no matter what. Now, it is possible that the Republicans will make that impossible for her to do, uh, that they will cut off aid. A lot depends here on the congressional elections in November. We focus on what is going to happen in the presidential election. Is Trump going to win? Is Harris going to win? But you want to remember whether the Republicans or the Democrats end up controlling the Senate and the House of Representatives matters enormously. If the Democrats do well in the Senate elections and in the House elections and they end up controlling uh, both houses of Congress, then there's not much the Republicans can do uh, to thwart Harris's interests or efforts to support Ukraine. But if the Republicans end up dominating one house or both houses, it'll be a different story. So we have to see what the political constellation of forces looks like uh, in November before we can determine whether or not Harris will be able to execute uh, the policy that she plans uh, unemploying towards Ukraine. You, you talk about the only possibility that will change the whole situation is Ukraine lose the war. And when will this kind of situation happen from your point of view? Well, the fact is that Ukraine is already losing the war. Mm -hmm. It's lost four oblasts. It's lost Crimea. And if you look at events on the battlefield, the Russians are winning on the battlefield. And they're winning on the battlefield because they have a great advantage in weaponry, especially artillery. They have a great advantage in manpower. And they have air superiority. So events on the battlefield now favor the Russians. And if the war continues, the Russians are likely to conquer even more territory than they now control. The Russians now control about 20% of Ukraine's territory. They'll end up conquering even more than that 20% if the war goes on. So at some point, the Ukrainians are going to say enough is enough. It's not clear you know, where that that point is, but there is a point where the Russian, where the Ukrainians will say enough is enough and they will go to the negotiating table and the Russians will be the victors. It will not be a decisive victory. Russia is not going to defeat Ukraine the way it defeated Nazi Germany in World War II. You remember the Russians or the Soviets ended up in Berlin and the Soviet, Soviet Union decisively defeated Germany. That's not going to happen with regard to Ukraine. Ukraine is not going to be decisively defeated. It's going to end up as a dysfunctional rump state.
but the fact is it's going to lose a huge slug of territory. And then there will be a frozen conflict. Mm -hmm. And uh, where that point is in the future is hard to say. But I would argue it's not far off simply because the Ukrainian military is doing so badly on the battlefield. And there's so little hope that it can rescue the situation. But they're going to the Kursk right now. They're, they're assaulting the territory in Russia. The offensive into Kursk is a disaster for the Ukrainians. Here in the West, it's portrayed as a great victory. Uh, the Ukrainians are said to be uh, redressing the balance and uh, the momentum is now uh, swinging in favor of Ukraine. Uh, this is uh, an argument that bears no resemblance to reality. Uh, what's happening in Kursk is a disaster for Ukraine. First of all, the main battlefields are in uh, eastern Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Russians are doing very well in those battles in eastern Ukraine. They were doing very well in those battles in eastern Ukraine before August 6th, which is the date that the Russians, uh, that the Ukrainians invaded uh, the Kursk area. Uh, well, what happened is that the Ukrainians pulled their forces, pulled some key fighting forces off the eastern front so that they could execute the Kursk offensive. So they weakened themselves on the critically important Eastern Front. So the Russians are now doing better in Eastern Ukraine than they were before August 6th. Now, with regard to the Kursk offensive, the Ukrainians, as you know, have gone on the offensive. But any time you go on the offensive, your troops and your armored vehicles are out in the open and they're moving. Mm. So they're exposed to enemy fire. And very importantly, the Ukrainians do not have air superiority. They do not have air cover. It's the Russians who have air superiority. So as the Ukrainian forces have attacked into the Kursk region, the Russians have used their air power, they have used drones, and they have used their great advantage in artillery to inflict, inflict massive casualties on the attacking Ukrainian forces. Some estimates are that the Russians are killing two times as many armored vehicles every day in the Kursk region than they are killing anywhere else on the battlefield. Uh, furthermore, they have inflicted about 4,000 casualties out of the 10,000 troops that invaded Kursk on August 6. So the fact that they're launching, the Ukrainians are launching this offensive into Ukraine is causing them to suffer huge casualties. Then you ask yourself, well, the Russians must be suffering casualties too. But that's not the case. The Russians are suffering small numbers of casualties, not large numbers of casualties like the Ukrainians are. And why is that the case? Because there are actually remarkably few Russians in that area. The reason that the Ukrainian incursion into, U into the Kursk area was able to conquer so much territory was because there were no Russians there. It was not like they defeated the Russians mm -hmm. in the process of conquering that territory. There were hardly any Russians there. So they easily rolled into the Kursk region. And it was, again, Russian air power, Russian drones, and Russian artillery that went to work on those attacking Ukrainian forces and caused all those casualties. All right. Oh, okay, now let's turn to Gaza. Uh, how can this upcoming election change the situation, the disastrous and tragic situation in Gaza? The upcoming election will have no effect uh, on the war uh, in Gaza. Uh, the United States will support Israel unconditionally, whether Kamala Harris is in the White House, Joe Biden is in the White House, or Donald Trump is in the White House. Uh, in the United States, we have this powerful lobby. Uh, it's called the Israel Lobby. Uh, it has awesome power 
over policymakers, especially when it comes to making uh, policy with regard to Israel. And no matter what Israel does uh, in Gaza, or no matter what Israel does to the Palestinians, the United States will uh, support it unconditionally. And there is nothing uh, Kamala Harris has said or done uh, to lead one to think that she will change our policy toward Israel and toward the Middle East in any meaningful way. And of course, Trump has made it clear that he's going to continue to support Israel no matter what. So what, regardless of what happens uh, in November in the presidential election, and even in the congressional elections, U.S. policy toward Israel and towards Gaza is not going to change. You just talk about Israel lobby, and we know that you publish a well-known book, also titled Israel Lobby several years ago. So is, are they as influential as before or are they getting more influential to the U.S. politics? I think the lobby is more influential uh, in terms of its dealings with policymakers and politicians today than it was in 2006 mm. when Steve Walton and I wrote the article and 2007 when we wrote the book. It, it's more powerful in terms of its dealing with policymakers, uh, politicians. Uh, to put it more generally, the lobby is more powerful at the elite level. Uh, at the public level, it's less influential today than it was when we wrote the article in the book. Uh, and there is much less enthusiastic support toward Israel and much more enthusiastic support of the Palestinians in the public today than there was back then. So what you have today is something of a disjuncture between the public and the elites on the subject of Israel. And you see this, by the way, reflected in the Democratic National Convention, right? Uh, the leaders of the Democratic Party made sure that no person who was sympathetic to the Palestinians, be that person a Palestinian, an Arab American, or just a progressive Democrat, that no person of that sort would be able to speak at the convention, right? Nevertheless, if you looked at what happened at the convention, if you looked at, what, at who was there, there were a huge number of people, mainly outside the convention, although some were inside the convention, who were deeply committed to supporting the Palestinians and badly wanted someone to get up before the convention and speak on behalf of the Palestinians to criticize what was going on or what is going on in Gaza. But the Democratic Party elites would not allow that to happen. So what you see here is evidence of that disjuncture between what's happening at the elite level where policymakers and politicians remain firmly committed to Israel because the Israel lobby gives them no choice. Whereas down here in the body politic, uh, the tides are shifting and there is much more criticism of Israel today than there was in the past. So we're actually just out of DNC and we saw what happened. Uh, the situation we see a lot of base that are not satisfied with the Democratic uh, parties policy towards Gaza or Palestine. And uh, some people are saying this Democratic Party are actually uh, shooting themselves uh, in their feet by supporting Israel because they, they will lose a lot of uh, vote. And, and the idea is that people do have vote. They, if they, they see things they don't like, they can, they can put the pressure on the Democratic Party's nominee, which is, who is Kamala Harris. So what happened right now? Two points. One is, 
people do have the right to vote. But the question is, do they have a meaningful choice here between Donald Trump and Kamala Harris when it comes to Israel and the genocide in Gaza? And the answer is they have no meaningful choice because there's no difference between Donald Trump and Kamala Harris on how the United States should deal with Israel. Uh, there's just no meaningful difference. So your vote really doesn't matter. My second point has to do with what you say about the Democratic Party. There is no question that the Democratic Party has a real problem. It has a large progressive wing that's filled with people who are super critical of Israel, who are well aware that a genocide is taking place and want a fundamental change at the top in the Democratic Party. At the same time, there are a large number of American Jews who are deeply committed to the Democratic Party, who want the Democrats to continue to support Israel unconditionally. The problem that Kamala Harris faces, and it's a problem that Joe Biden would have faced were he running, indeed it's a problem that any Democratic policymaker would face if he or she were running for president on the Democratic ticket, is that if you move to accommodate or to appease or to support the pro-Palestinian faction, you alienate those American Jews who are deeply committed to Israel. And if, on the other hand, you try to reassure American Jews who are in the Democratic Party that you will support Israel in the future, much the way you have in the past, you alienate basically the progressive wing of the party. And given that almost everybody expects the election between Kamala Harris and Donald Trump to be very close, every vote matters. Right. And here you have a situation where Kamala Harris is in a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation. Mm -hmm. And it could be the case, we don't know uh, for sure how this will play itself out, but it could be the case that she will lose and she will lose in large part because she has sided with the pro-Israel forces inside of the Democratic Party against uh, the progressive wing or the uh, pro-Palestinian side. So when we talk about, you say, Israel lobby is getting more influential right now. Uh, in the case of war in Gaza, how do they influence the U.S. politics this time? How, why every, uh, almost every politician in the United States are just follow what they want? Well, virtually every politician on Capitol Hill knows full well uh, that the lobby will monitor carefully what their position is on Israel. And uh, if they support Israel no matter what, they give Israel unequivocal support, and they need campaign contributions, the lobby will make sure that campaign contributions are funneled to them. If, on the other hand, they favor a policy that's critical of Israel or limits what Israel can do, let's say in Gaza, the lobby will put its gun sights on those politicians and go to great lengths to make sure they are defeated in the next election. So every politician on Capitol Hill understands full well that he or she has a deep-seated interest in supporting Israel, no matter what, for purposes of his or her political survival. So that's very important. And then when you have individuals who run for president, those candidates, whether it's Kamala Harris, Donald Trump, Joe Biden, they all understand full well that in the campaign, they have to say unequivocally that they support Israel that they have a profound commitment to the Jewish state. And then once they're in office, if they begin to veer away from the policy line that the lobby faces, the lobby will put enormous pressure on them 
to get back in line and to become pro-Israel in the extreme once again. And the lobby has a very sophisticated playbook. This is a truly impressive operation. I mean, the institutions and the individual who make up the lobby uh, wield tremendous power and they do it in very effective ways. So we can expect, you know, Kamala Harris or Donald Trump uh, not to veer far from the policy line that uh, Joe Biden has taken uh, since he moved into the White House and certainly since he took since October 7th. You talk about these two parties, candidates, they, they actually have similar idea about supporting Israel. And also in the United States, most of the people, they, uh, their attitude towards Russia is not very positive. And you talk about the, the, the foreign policy blob in this country. I come to the White House for 15 years. I can sense there is certain power that push U.S. foreign policy towards some direction, but I can tell who are they, like, who are the blob exactly? Well, I think when people talk about the blob, they're talking about the American foreign policy establishment writ large. You know, we're talking about policymakers, politicians, people in the media, people in think tanks, people in academia. Uh, who care greatly about international politics uh, and in particular care about American foreign policy. And the reason that establishment is referred to as the blob, I believe, is because there's hardly any difference between Republicans and Democrats, with one notable exception that I'll get to in a moment. There's remarkably little difference between those Republicans in the foreign policy establishment and those Democrats in the foreign policy establishment. They tend to think in the same way about the United States. They all believe that we are the indispensable nation. We should be the most powerful state on the planet. They all think that we have a right and a responsibility to roam around the world and interfere in the politics of other countries uh, on topics like Israel, on topics like China, and even on topics like Ukraine, for the most part you see that there is a remarkable consensus. Uh, so the idea that these Republicans who do foreign policy and these Democrats who do foreign policy are at each other's throats, that they're mortal enemies, bears little resemblance to what's actually going on. It's kind of a seamless web. There's not much difference between the two parties. And that's why it's referred to as a blob. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, the one exception to this is Donald Trump. Donald Trump is in favor of a different foreign policy. He's in favor of restraint. He doesn't view the United States as an indispensable nation. He's not interested in running all over the world, interfering in the politics of other countries. It's just not how he thinks about things. The question you have to ask yourself is whether or not you think Trump can beat the blob back. In other words, what I'm saying here is that when Donald Trump moves into the White House in 2017, in January of 2017, and he says quite explicitly that he's going to fundamentally alter American foreign policy, does he do that over the next four years? In the contest between Trump and the blob in his first term in office, who wins? it's perfectly clear that the blob won and that Trump was defeated. And by the way, before that, President Obama was elected on the platform that he was going to fundamentally alter American foreign policy. He was going to put an end to the forever wars. He was going to do nation building at home. By the time he was done with his eight years in the White House, the blob had defeated him as well. So the blob or the foreign policy establishment, which sometimes called the deep state, it defeated Obama, and it defeated Obama, excuse me, Trump, in his first term. Now, Trump, who's fully aware of this, says things are going to be different if I get elected this fall and I move into the White House in January of 2025. I learned my lesson. I'm going to bring in people who share my views, 
and we are going to defeat the blob. We are going to defeat the foreign policy establishment. Uh, if I had to bet a lot of money on who's going to win that fight after Trump moves into the White House, and of course we're assuming he wins the election, I would bet my money on the blob, not on Trump. How does it happen? I mean, I, I, I travel with uh, the White House to Finland for this Putin and Trump summit. I, I know Trump really trying to improve the relationship with Russia. And then also... And he failed. He failed. Uh, how do this blob influence him and that him cannot make his own decision as U.S. president? Well, he's only one person, right? And as you know, inside the Beltway, there are lots of institutions and lots of powerful individuals who are committed to maintaining uh, the status quo, uh, who are committed to American exceptionalism, who are committed to American primacy, who are committed to the standing policies. And they are very sophisticated, very powerful. Uh, have a lot of experience, and any one president who tries to take them on is going to be outnumbered and uh, is going to be at a significant disadvantage. Uh, and you want to remember, this is a very powerful consensus, mm. right? Now, one could argue it's beginning to break down over Ukraine. Ukraine is the one issue where you see a crack in the edifice, mm. right? There, you know, Trump definitely and J.D. Vance definitely want to get out of Ukraine, and they both want to have better relations with Russia. And there are a number of people in the Republican Party who feel that way. But again, whether they ultimately prevail is an open question. It is possible that this time, if Trump is elected, he'll be able to beat back the blob. But again, I just wouldn't bet a lot of money on that. And also, I'm curious, I, I covered Joe Biden while he was vice president, and he welcomed China's rise. And also, uh, during his campaign in 2019, he said China is not going to eat Americans' lunch. But while he entered the White House, he totally changes policy to align with the blob's policy on China. What, how, how does this happen? Well, I have a very simple explanation here. Uh, Joe Biden, as you know, when he was the head of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and when he was the vice president uh, under Barack Obama, was deeply committed to engagement with China. He wanted to have cooperative relations with China, uh, and he was not interested in pivoting to Asia and containing China. Trump becomes president in 2017. He abandons engagement, and it is Trump who initiates a policy of containment towards China. Now, four years later, Trump is defeated by Biden, and that means that Biden, who had been an arch proponent of engagement and an opponent of containment, now has an opportunity, when he moves back in the White House, to go back to engagement and to jettison Trump's policy of containment. He does not do that. As you said, he does exactly the opposite. He doubles down on containment. Mm -hmm. I think you could make a good argument that Biden was tougher on China than Trump was in his four years. So the question you have to ask yourself is why is that the case? Why didn't Biden go back to engagement? Why did he continue uh, this policy of containment that Trump had initiated? And the answer is simply that by 2017, by roughly 2017, China was a great power. And because it was a great power and we had left unipolarity behind, the United States was then concerned, this is 2017, with the rise of China to the point where it had to think about how to contain China. China was no longer a weak state in the system. It was economically and militarily becoming increasingly powerful. And when that happens, the United States invariably puts it gun, its gun sights on that country and goes to great lengths to contain it. So my point to you would be, if China had grown 
economically in a much less impressive way, if it had grown economically more slowly and it was economically more weaker in 2017 and 2020, I think engagement would have continued. The reason that it didn't happen that way was because of China's incredibly impressive economic rise. And as you know, I started arguing in the early 2000s that if China continued to rise economically in a really impressive way, that rise would lead to an intense security competition between the United States and China because China would translate much of its economic might into military might. China, for good strategic reasons, would try to dominate Asia. And the United States, for good strategic reasons, would try to prevent that from happening. And this is exactly what you see occurring now. And if you listen to Kamala Harris talk at the Democratic National Convention, she said explicitly in the competition that's now taking place and will continue in the future between China and the United States, we have every intention of winning. This is containment. This is not engagement. And again, my basic argument here is a structural one. It's the mere fact that China has become so powerful that has changed the nature of the relationship between these two countries. It has nothing to do with culture. It has nothing to do with who the individuals are in China. It's not due to Xi Jinping. It's not due to Donald Trump or Joe Biden. It's the structure of the system. You can't take a country like China, which has so many people, and make it incredibly wealthy and not end up in a security competition with the United States. So how long will this situation continue from your point of view? It will continue for the foreseeable future. Uh, I mean, the only way, it, it bears, by the way, marked resemblance to the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union, right? Uh, we had this intense security competition, basically went from about 1947 to 1989 when the Cold War ended. And then, as you know, in December 1991, the Soviet Union disappeared. Uh, but uh, it would have gone on forever and ever, except for the fact that the, Russian eco the Soviet economy uh, was in trouble and could not keep up with the American economy. Uh, and that led to reforms that led to the unraveling of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War. But absent that, the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union would still be taking place today. So one could argue that the conflict or the competition between the United States and China will continue as long as China has a robust economy uh, and as long as the United States has a robust economy. And I see no sign that either economy is slowing down. Uh, so I would argue that uh, this competition is likely to continue uh, long after I'm dead and long after you're dead. Uh, I wish that that were not the case. Uh, I think it's tragic uh, that we have this situation, but I do think it was inevitable. Uh, and by the way, this is why my book on great power politics is called The Tragedy of Great Power Politics. This is the tragedy of great power politics. Is there any essential area that China or U.S. must work with China? Absolutely. What both sides have to do is they have to understand how dangerous this situation is mm -hmm. and how catastrophic a war between the two sides might be. And therefore, the need for them, for both sides, to manage this competition as carefully as possible. And if a crisis does occur, a Cuban Missile Crisis-like crisis, they have to understand how essential it is for decision makers on both sides to make sure that it doesn't turn into a war. Uh, that is the key point that both sides want to keep uh, in mind moving forward. Very important, when you look at this competition between the United States on one hand and China on the other hand, that there are a number of worrisome flashpoints. People tend to focus on Taiwan, which is an obvious potential flashpoint, but there's also the East China Sea, 
and there's also the South China Sea. Then there's the Korean Peninsula, where a war between South Korea and North Korea could end up bringing the Chinese in on the side of the North Koreans and the Americans in on the side of the South Koreans. This, of course, is what happened in the fall of 1950, right? And then you also have a potential for a real conflict uh, involving China and India up in the Himalaya Mountains. So we're dealing with a situation where there are a number of dangerous flashpoints. And this is why I say we all, both Chinese and Americans, want to be very aware of where those flashpoints are and go to great lengths to make sure that a crisis does not occur at any of those flashpoints. And if a crisis does occur, to think about the best ways to shut down that crisis immediately. And we talk about the military. I always have a, a question about the U.S. military. And you've been, you studied in the uh, military academy and served in the U.S. Uh, force, Air Force, uh, for four years. I was actually in the army. Oh, okay. Perfect. I was an enlisted man in the army, a regular soldier, before I went to West Point. Uh -huh. And then after I went to West Point, I was an officer in the, uh, in the Air Force. Right, so... Uh, ten years of my life. Ten years in your life in the yes. U.S. military. So, why, why is the United States is always in wars, you know, for hundreds of years? What's going on? Well, I would argue that the United States uh, has only gotten into a lot of wars uh, since uh, 1945. Mm -hmm. It was not involved in a lot of wars before uh, the Cold War. Uh, obviously, it was involved in World War II and World War I. Uh, but I think what's happened uh, since 1945 uh, is a function of first the Cold War and then the unipolar moment. During the Cold War, the United States and the Soviet Union were involved in a global security competition. We engaged with the Soviets all over the planet. Uh, both sides thought that almost every area of the world or every region of the world was worth fighting over. And the end result of that is that the United States got involved in wars in places like Vietnam. Uh, the United States should never have fought in Vietnam. It was a foolish war. It had the, uh, the, the war in Vietnam had hardly any implications for American security. But the reason we ended up fighting there is that we believed in the domino theory, mm. which said that if we lost in Vietnam and Vietnam became communist, then Thailand would become communist, then Japan would become communist, then Korea would become communist, and pretty soon European countries would be communist, and finally the Americans, the United States, would become communist. This is the famous or infamous domino theory. And if you believe in the domino theory, you have to fight everywhere, because you don't want that first domino anywhere to fall. So what you had was this global competition between the United States and the Soviet Union, right, that was underpinned by the domino theory. And that led us to get militarily involved, not necessarily to fight wars, but to get militarily involved all over the planet and to fight a handful of wars, some of which were unnecessary. I'm choosing my words carefully here. But that was nothing compared to the unipolar moment, which occurs after the Cold War ends and the Soviet Union collapses. So this is the period roughly from 1991 up to 2017. This is when the United States is fighting lots of wars, what we sometimes call the forever wars, right? And this is when many Chinese people get the sense that the United States does nothing but fight wars. Now what's going on in the unipolar moment? Two things. Number one, the United States is a remarkably powerful country. By definition, if you're in a unipolar world, the United States is the only great power on the planet. So we are remarkably powerful and therefore free to use that power to fight wars in places like Iraq and Afghanistan. That's point number one. Point number two is the United States is a deeply liberal country and its liberalism affects its foreign policy outlook. 
American foreign policymakers and many people in the American public believe that it is in our interest to run around the world and to turn other countries into liberal democracies, to make other countries look like us. We talked about engagement before. U.S. policy towards China was known as engagement. What was the ultimate goal of engagement? It was to turn China into a liberal democracy. What is the ultimate goal of the color revolutions that the United States has been purveying in Eastern Europe and would like to purvey in Russia? The ultimate goal of those color revolutions is to turn those countries in Eastern Europe and turn Russia, just like China, into a liberal democracy. So you see this liberal ideology that sits at the heart of the American psyche, right, gives us a powerful incentive to run around the world and do social engineering, to make the world over in America's image. And when you marry that fact with the fact that we are so powerful, it's not hard to see how we end up fighting wars to reshape the globe, to spread democracy, to spread capitalism, and so forth and so on. So what's happened uh, in the unipolar moment, uh, and this is again the period from roughly 1991 to 2017, is the United States got into the business of using military force uh, in very liberal ways all around the planet and getting itself into a handful of disastrous wars. So you talk about this liberal ideology, and there are a lot of other liberal democracies in this world, but no any other country is like the United States, put liberal ideology as, as if it's a, it's a religion, it's a belief, and they want to spread it everywhere. Why? Well, I actually think that after the Cold War ended, uh, this liberal ideology took hold in Western Europe in a really big way. Uh, and I think the British, the French, and the Germans, and even the Italians uh, drank the Kool-Aid, which is to say they firmly supported uh, America's global mission. They firmly supported this liberal mission. So there was very little resistance from the Europeans uh, toward this uh, American policy of what I call liberal hegemony. I think the West Europeans bought on to that ideology. But the big difference between the United States on one hand and these Western European countries is that we had the military power to make it possible to think that we could use that force we had to spread liberalism around the globe. The British have gone along with us. The British uh, help us, but the British don't matter much because they're militarily not very powerful. The United States is an incredibly powerful country. And you take an incredibly powerful country that has a messianic, a messianic ideology, right, that is committed to spreading democracy. And what you end up is with what you end up with is what I would call a crusader state. The United States is a crusader state. But again, going back to the Europeans, they're our allies in the process. They go along with us. Uh, and uh, uh, and you see this in Ukraine, right? The, uh, the Western Europeans, and certainly the Eastern Europeans, are with the United States all the way. And I think people, somehow, what we heard from, especially the Republicans in the Congress right now, they kind of doubt about this, like, uh, about, like, spreading, uh, can, can the United States really spread in this idea like when the, it was, when, when the United States was uh, a unipolar power. Uh, are, people start, uh, are people starting to doubt about this right now? 
very important to distinguish between the publics and the elites, mm -hmm. number one, and to distinguish between the two parties. Let's just start with the Democratic Party. In the Democratic Party, down below in the public, you have lots of progressives who do not like the idea of American primacy and the idea of using an American military force to fight wars all over the planet. On the other hand, you have a lot of neoconservatives, right? Uh, and uh, you have a lot of people like Joe Biden and Kamala Harris uh, who are deeply committed to American primacy, right? So you have inside that Democratic Party down below, right? You have uh, a split, okay? At the elite level, the neoconservatives, the hardliners, the primacists, they dominate. And the progressives take a back seat. The progressives don't have much influence at the elite level, okay? So what I'm saying to you is, if you look at the body politic, and you look inside the Democratic Party, you see that there is a real divide. You see the same thing inside the Republican Party, okay? You have inside the Republican Party lots of neoconservatives, right, who want the Republicans to continue to pursue uh, a primacist foreign policy, who want the United States to continue running around the world, to continue acting as a crusader state. At the same time, you have a growing body of people inside the Republican Party who want restraint, who are tired of all these wars. So again, what you have in both parties is a split when you talk about the base. But up at the elite level in the Republican Party, because Trump has been so successful, you see that at the elite level, that division is beginning to show among policymakers and leading politicians. You don't see that in the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party is unified between, behind Kamala Harris. But inside the Republican Party, you have people like Lindsey Graham on one side and other hawkish Republicans and people like Donald Trump on the other side. So you're beginning to see this set of differences that exist down below in both parties manifest themselves at the elite level in the Republican Party. And it is possible, and we talked about this before, if Kamala Harris loses because of the Israel and Gaza issue, that those progressives will begin to have a large influence higher up at the elite level. Right. Three more topics. Uh, one is on the, uh, is the United States ready for a female? Asian, African American president, and especially in the background that we see the white supremacy is rising in this country. I think that there's no question that uh, most Americans uh, have no problem with uh, uh, a female uh, Asian slash black. Uh, president. Uh, I don't think it is that big an issue. Uh, you want to remember, we have already had a black president, uh, and he was elected by a wide margin in 2008, and he was reelected in 2012. And although Hillary Clinton, you were talking about a woman, uh, although Hillary, Clim Hillary Clinton was defeated in 2016, she did get more votes than Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of evidence that there are a huge number of people who have no problem with a woman president. I think Kamala Harris's biggest problem is that she is a weak candidate. Uh, if you look at how she arrived at being the Democratic nominee and you look at her past behavior, uh, you look at her policy positions, she's got a lot of problems. Now she may be able to overcome those problems, but I don't think uh, 
that uh, the fact that she is a black slash Asian woman is going to matter very much. Uh, and one could argue that a lot of people who might not normally vote uh, will actually come out and vote because she is uh, a black slash Asian woman. Uh, I mean, we'll see, you know, exactly what happens. Just with regard to white supremacy, um, you want to understand that because of immigration uh, into the United States, uh, the idea that this is a white country uh, is uh, a hard argument to make. There's no question whites are the majority, but we have huge numbers of non-whites in this country uh, to include Hispanics, to include blacks, to include Asians. And as time goes by, uh, the United States is going to become increasingly non-white uh, just because of immigration. Uh, and uh, there's just nothing that can be done about that. I'm not arguing that there is something that should be done about that. I think immigration is a good thing. And I think, by the way, all of the immigration that has happened and will continue to happen is what guarantees that the United States will be a very powerful state moving forward. I think a country like China that has significant demographic problems and is not an immigrant culture is in real trouble because you can't import people the way we can import people mm -hmm. to deal with the fact that local or indigenous people don't make lots of babies. So I think immigration is a wonderful thing. But as a result of immigration, the United States is going to be a less white country over time. And there will be some people, for sure, there will be a narrow slice of the population uh, who resists uh, this trend. But uh, it's inevitable, and the United States, I believe, will deal with it quite well. I would point out to you uh, that when I went into the Army uh, in uh, 1965, the United States uh, was at that point in time uh, a country that had systemic racism. Systemic racism. Mm -hmm. uh, in the South, we had Jim Crow America. Right? That was systemic racism. And Jim Crow ended in 1964 with the Civil Rights Act and then in 1965. Those two pieces of legislation, the Civil Rights Act in 64 and the Voting Rights Act in 65, put an end to systematic racism. Of course, it took a time. It took time to play out. But when I went into the Army in 1965, the Voting Rights Act had still not been passed. Mm. So I went into an army, right, that was, you know, a product of a society that had systemic racism built into it. Over time, that went away, right? Jim Crow America disappeared. Am I saying that there has been no racism or there is no racism in the United States? Of course not. But there is nothing compared when we talk about racing, there's nothing today compared to what we had in 1964 and 1965. That was systemic racism. We still have racism. But again, you want to remember that Barack Obama was elected president, and you want to remember that Kamala Harris is one of the two candidates for the presidency, and she may win. And uh, there are a number of people I know who say that she will win. So I find the argument that you know, the United States is suffering from systemic racism to be wrong-headed. Again, but which again is not to deny that there is racism in the United States. And indeed, there's racism in every society. I mean, all you have to do is look at what's happening in Britain, uh, look at what's happening in Germany and in Italy. Uh, there's no question that in virtually every society on the planet, you have a dominant group, and that dominant group invariably has problems of one sort or another with the other. But I think that there are probably few countries on the planet that do uh, as well with integrating the other into its bits than the United States. Again, I don't want to be Panglossian here and uh, say there are never any problems, and, and so forth and so on. This is always a very difficult and tricky issue. Uh, but I think the United States does a pretty good job. And I think once we got rid of Jim Crow America, uh, we went a long way, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, towards improving uh, the racial situation in this country. The other question, you say the why population is declining, but we still see the religion. Uh, Christianity is still, the great majority of Americans are Christians, according to, and actually I traveled to across America three years ago to 20 states, and I do find the United States is a very religious, religious country compared to the Western uh, countries that I have visited. Uh, how does this, how does Christianity influence Americans' views on foreign policy? Before I answer that question, I would just point out to you that many of the immigrants who come into this country who are categorized as non-white are Christians. Uh, you want to remember that the largest group to come into the United States since 1965, when we had a major revision of the immigration law, uh, uh, the largest group are, are Hispanics. And Hispanics are either uh, Catholics or evangelicals. And uh, you want to also remember that many Asians who come to the United States are Christians as well, or become Christians once they get uh, to the United States. Uh, and the black community uh, has a rich history uh, of commitment to the Christian religion. So I don't, I think in terms of the melting pot, in terms of, you know, the racism issue inside uh, the society, I think that's separate uh, from religion. I don't think religion fuels that in any way. Uh, but with regard to foreign policy, uh, I don't think religion matters very much at all, mm. except for one possible case uh, on American foreign policy. Uh, and I think that's because although Americans are religious, that religion is not so deep-seated uh, that it affects how they think about foreign policy. The one exception are the Christian Zionists mm. who are deeply committed to Israel. You know, many people think of Jews as American Jews as being the only Americans who would be deeply committed to Israel. But we know very well that there are lots of Christian Zionists. These are Christian fundamentalists who are deeply committed to Israel. But that's the exception. I think most Americans, despite their affinity for Christianity and for religion more generally, uh, uh, don't let their religion get in the way of their foreign policy views. To the extent there's a religion that affects the foreign policy views of Americans, it's liberalism. Mm -hmm. One could argue that liberalism is a secular religion. And as I said before, that secular religion, liberalism, certainly at the elite level, deeply influences American foreign policy. So, uh, a good realist like me tends to argue that things like religion and ideology don't matter very much. Uh, but to the extent that they do, uh, I think it's not Christianity or any other religion that really is driving uh, the train here. I think it's liberal ideology. Liberalism is the religion. Uh, that influences American foreign policy, um, that, that influences how Americans think about foreign policy. Last question, I promise. Uh, we see many people actually now talking more and more about possibility of civil war. And there's even a movie this year uh, called Civil War. I know you're an American, you don't want to see this situation happening, but in terms of realism, is there a possibility this will happen? Is there a possibility? Uh, I think there is a, and I'm choosing my words carefully here, a very tiny possibility. Uh, I think it is more likely, this is not to say that it's likely, I think it's more likely that you will have political violence inside the American body politic over the course of the next decade. 
there is no question, as we talked about earlier, that there is huge dissatisfaction in the American public about the existing political system. People are really unhappy. To put it in slightly different terms, people are angry. That's why Donald Trump has been so successful. It's why Bernie Sanders has been so successful. People are angry. And there's no question, given the tradition of violence in the United States, that that anger could turn to violence. But that's different than talking about a civil war. A civil war is where the country divides itself into two parts, or ends up being divided into two parts, a red part and a blue part, and they go to war against each other. I'd make two points there. One is I don't think the differences are that severe that uh, you would have the necessary political incentives to unleash a civil war. Second point I would make is I think that the deep state is powerful enough at this point in time that it would go to great lengths to shut down a civil war before it started. Uh, the surveillance capabilities of the deep state. This is true in a country like China as well as the United States. The surveillance capabilities of any modern state are awesome. The state is able to monitor its individual citizens today in ways that was unthinkable in the past. So the deep state in the United States monitors what people are doing and it looks for evidence of political violence, um, evidence of terrorism, evidence of rebellion, and so forth and so on. And then the deep state has the military capacity to crush uh, political violence and to crush insurrection. Uh, so I think that uh, to get a civil war going in the United States would be extraordinarily different, difficult. Uh, given that the, the anger is not that great yet and the state has uh, the capacity uh, to deal with political violence today in ways that it did not in the past. Well, the deep state that you mentioned is the intelligence community. Not just the intelligence community, it's, mm -hmm. it's also the American military, uh, police forces, uh, and uh, uh, it's just a very impressive apparatus. Look, a modern state is deeply committed to monitoring its people. Right? It, it, it wants to keep track of people. It wants to know exactly what they are doing. And a modern state is also remarkably powerful. It, it, it controls the means of violence. Uh, that's what a modern state is all about. Right? So you don't want to go so far as to say it's all seen but it comes close to being all-seeing, and it has at its disposal uh, the ability to, to crush resistance, to use force to crush, resist, to crush resistance, uh, because it controls the means of violence. This is not to deny that given the Second Amendment, there are lots of Americans running around with guns, indeed running around with automatic weapons. Uh, and this is where you might get political violence. But if you were to get that kind of political violence, the question you have to ask yourself is what would the state do? You think the state would just stand by and let that political violence play itself out and maybe morph into a civil war? I don't think that's likely at all. I think that once political violence broke out, the state would move in with massive force and the state would go to great length to shut down uh, any violence or any conflict as quickly as possible. Uh, and that if that involved brutal behavior and throwing people into jail, the state would do that. So this is a, actually a controlled democracy. That's what you mean? Oh, oh, what? A controlled democracy. The U.S. is... Look, in, whether it's a democracy or an autocracy, we're talking about the state. And the state in a democracy, the state in an autocracy, the state in a communist country, 
is remarkably powerful. The state is remarkably powerful regardless of the political system that holds in a state. Again, whether it's liberal, uh, communist, authoritarian, call it what you want. In every one of those cases, the state is going to be enormously powerful because the modern state, by definition, is enormously powerful. It, it intervenes in almost every aspect of our life. It's very interested in making sense of what's going on in the world around it or in the state uh, and in the world around it has tremendous intelligence capabilities, tremendous monitoring capabilities, and it controls the means of violence. Uh, it is more powerful than any other actors uh, inside the state. And if any of those actors decide that they're going to turn to violence to upset the political status quo, to overthrow the state, uh, I think you can rest assured that the state will come down on them like a ton of bricks. Uh, and again, my point is the modern state, whether it's China you're talking about, Russia you're talking about, or Joe Biden and the United States government that you're talking about, those modern states have lots of power and they use it when they think it's in their interest. Thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. You're more than welcome. That is uh, the subject. I like that. I like intellectual combat. And I think China is more realist to the core. Somewhere, either here or upstairs or at my office or in Michigan, the book can be found. But I can't find it. At least you're helping the economy. I'm helping the economy.